So this is your first clip to do with statistics. Now, you need this pack in order to watch this clip. So make sure you've got your research methods pack. Uh, and then turn to page 14. And page 14, 15, 16, 17 is what I'm going to talk through now. So what I suggest you do, if you haven't read it, pause the clip and then read through those bits of the pack on your own because I'm literally going to talk through it so it makes more sense if you've read it first, okay? Right, so, have you done that? Good. Right, so statistics. Now, if you read textbooks, um, often just looking at it can freak people out a bit, but it's actually really, really simple. So what I'm going to try to do in the next few clips is just break it down and explain it um, in a way that hopefully isn't too overcomplicated. Right, so statistics. Right, there's two types of statistics. We have descriptive stats and inferential stats. Now, you should, in the year one, have covered the descriptive stats. Okay, so what are they? So descriptive stats, I always think of it, is like a way of, my drawing's not very good, <laughs> eyeballing the data, okay? So your descriptive stats are gonna be things like your averages. Uh, your measures of central tendency. Can you remember what they are, measures of central tendency? your mean, your median, and your mode. So if you do your mean, median, your mode, instantly you can find out the average of your data. So just by looking at these, you can go, oh, okay. So um, the example you've got in your pack is about energy drinks. So by looking at the averages, if you suddenly see, oh my God, I've got a much higher average for the energy drink group, then you can think, oh, okay, actually maybe energy drinks make, make you talk more. So that's your descriptive stats. Now also, if you think about it because it's eyeballing or visual, we also in here have graphs, and we also have um, measures of dispersion. Can you remember what those are? So that's your range and your standard deviation. Now, with the descriptive stats, all they tell us, they give us a very quick overview. We can't make any firm judgments about the data from the descriptive stats. We can just say, oh, it looks like when the people drank the litre of energy drink, they spoke more. Now, in order to make firm judgments, we, need, we use inferential statistics. Now, when I say firm, we, we, we never in psychology say we're 100% sure that the energy drink has led to uh, the person talking more. And we'll talk about why in the second clip. So, inferential stats, basically, we do some maths. <laughs> we do a little bit of maths. And it, by doing that and looking at the results, it allows us to say, oh, do you know what? We can be 95% sure that our results are not down to chance. So basically, from doing my experiment on 100 people, I can say, actually, it looks like energy drinks do make you talk more from the inferential statistics. You can do that from this. So, and that's the gist of it, really, bizarrely. Now, we've got all these words here. Now, if you look at them, they might look a bit scary. But psychology loves to use complicated names for really simple things. Now all of this is in your pack, so all I'm going to do is talk you through the, the key words, and by doing it, we'll explain what I mean by this. So, inferential stats. So, you do your maths, um, and you come out with an answer. Okay, so don't worry too much about how you do the maths, we'll do that later. So you come out with an answer. So let's just say, the answer you get from doing your stats is 12. Now that, we don't call it an answer in psychology, we call it your observed value, or we call it your calculated um, value. So the answer you get is your observed value or your calculated value. That's, what, that's all that that means, it's the answer. Okay, so what do you do with that answer though? How do you know from 12 whether your energy drink has made you talk more? Now, what we do is we have to use this number and compare it against another number. And the other number we compare it against is called your critical value, okay? So what's a critical value? Now, a critical value um, is, now, if you think about it, people that really like maths a lot, they go away and they work out um, for each of the stats tests what number our observed value has to be more than or less than in order for your results to work, basically. That's all that it is. Don't worry about where it comes from. Don't worry about anything like that. All you need to know is how to find a critical value and what, it, what it's for. So you, 
How you work out if this works or not is you compare it against your critical value, basically. Which we're going to look at how to do in a minute. Okay, so, what else do you need to know? Now, oh, these are some good words to learn, okay, so. Now, the word significant, what does that mean? Now, basically, that is a posh way of saying your results have worked. So, if when you compare, you observe value with your critical value, so you say, ah, oh, look, it's worked. Actually, uh, our participants did definitely speak more when they were on the energy drink. Rather than we say it worked, we say it's significant. And so if it doesn't work, we say it's not significant. And that's all that that means. That's all that means. Um, now, alternative and null hypothesis. Now you know what these are, you've done these before. So your alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis that it um, is the hypothesis that states what you're looking for. So if you look at your pack here, our, recent, our alternative hypothesis was there will be a difference in the amount of words recorded during the three minute logic problem tasks if participants have just finished drinking a litre of water or a litre of energy drink. And our null hypothesis is saying that there's going to be no difference. So there'll be no difference in the amount. Now, the inferential stats is kind of all about the null hypothesis. So what we want to be able to do is decide do we accept our null hypothesis or do we reject it? Now, all you need to know is, if your results are significant, i.e. they worked, they worked, then we reject the null hypothesis because actually, remember the null hypothesis is there will be no difference. Well, if it's worked, if it's significant, then there is going to be a difference. So what we say is, our results are significant, therefore we reject the null hypothesis and we accept your alternative hypothesis because they're saying, yeah, it worked. And the opposite way around. So if the results are not significant, we simply reject our alternative hypothesis and we accept our null because we're saying there will be no difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. So these are just kind of, again, using kind of words you've not used before to explain something that's really simple. So you're with me. So, we know so far, uh, so we've, we've got our observed value, uh, we know how to, we, you know how to compare it to critical value, um, and we know about that. Now, how do you find out your critical value? So this is the last thing I'm going to do on the clip, and then I'll explain something else. Right, now, in your pack, you will see that you have, if you all turn to page 49, you'll see tables and tables of numbers, yeah? Now, these are critical value tables. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. These are critical value tables. Don't worry about them. Don't worry where they came from. But all you need to know is that you go into the table, you find your critical value, and then you compare it against your answer, and then you go, oh, yeah, it's worked. So how do you find your critical value? Now, there are three things you need to know. And they are, you need to know how many participants were in your experiment, basically. And we call that N. Um, so N is your number of participants. This is all in your pack. You, uh, you need to know if the test was directional or non-directional. And we also call that one or two tailed. So you should remember, one tailed, Think of a cap two tails. If there's one tail, then it's pointing in an obvious direction. So therefore, it's going, oh, it's pointing in that direction, so you know it's directional. Whereas a cap with two tails, it's not sure which direction it's going in. So it's non-directional. So you need to know if it's one tail or two tails, the number of participants, and then the level of significance. Now, the next clip, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But all you need to worry about is where you find that on the, the table. So I'm just going to zoom the camera in onto a critical value table and show you what I mean. So, can you see that, everybody? Okay, right, so there's a critical value table for the sign test. So if you have a look, you can see down here, you've got N here at the top, and if you go down, there are the values of N. So that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten participants, yeah? Now, along the top... It's got one tail test and two tail test. 
So you would de you decide which one it is. And then if you can see here, it says level of significance. Now you can see some numbers here. 0 0.05, 0 0.025. Again, don't worry about that too much. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So if you wanted to find a critical value, so let's do the example in your pack. So example one, it says you have 20 participants. So you go, oh, there you go. There's me 20 participants there. And then it says at 5% significance or 0 0.05 for a one-tailed test. So along the top, you simply, oh, there's me one-tailed there, and it's going to be 0 0.05, so you take your finger down to 0 0.05, and then to find the critical value, you just take your fingers down to basically where the two join. So there's your 20, and you go down, oh, look, there we go, um, it's 5. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, that's 0 0.05. Yeah. Um, sorry, the example in your pack I've put is 0 0.05. So if it was 0 0.5, it would be 5. If it was 0 0.05, then you go along there, and again, you do the same thing. You follow it down. Do, 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 do. And it's 3. Yeah, sorry, I've spot, spotted that. It's 0 0.05. And that's how you read a critical value table. It's simply that's all you do. Now, not to overcomplicate it or anything, but there are slightly different ways of finding the value of n. So if you are do, you've got a stats test where um, you are using independent group design. So if you remember what that is? So you've got different participants in each condition. It might be that actually, so that your value of n, it, it can't be 19, because maybe you've got 19 people in condition A, but you've got 20 people in condition B. So therefore you have to do it slightly differently for this. And there's slightly different ways of working this out for each of those different stats tests. Now, I won't explain that just here now, because it's explained beautifully in here. So to, find, to look at that, how you do it for um, an independent um, test, have a look at page 16, and it explains degrees of freedom here, yeah? So it's really, really simple. So, uh, so for example, for a T-test, you just would add up... Condition A, condition B, so 19 plus 20 participants, and then you just take away two. Now, if you have to work back these out, it will always stay in the critical value table for you at the top. Um, so, but I, again, I want you to have a read through that yourself to make sure that you understand how to do that. And remember, as part of your flipped homework, there are questions in the back for you that you need to do now. So you're gonna to turn to question 14 on page 47. And can you have a go at those questions to check you know about how to do critical value? Okay, and that is where we'll stop for this clip.